failed in your plan of your storm-tossed life, you place your hand in the nails again. Are you weary and worn to a toil and strife? Place your hand in the nail sardine. Place your hand in the nail sardine. Place your hand in the nail sardine. He will keep to the end. He's your dearest friend. Place your hand in the nail sardine. Are you walking alone? Stop with sleeping. <coughs> Wasn't paying attention and he's done. Yeah, it really. It looks business meeting Wednesday night. Reminds you of that. Time change next weekend. Reminds you of that one too. And uh, wow. 55 days till Christmas. Didn't hear a groan in the crowd. You're all ready, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys had a great day. Jill and I, we got to have part of the afternoon with J. 
Jessica and Andrew, it's always good to have them come into town. We did get to see Corey and Christy last Friday, went to, met them and Mina, had lunch with them, and those people gotta hate it when we come in, because lunch isn't just 30, 45 minutes, it's usually two, two and a half hours. And they keep coming by, and who was here? Do you want more tea? Do you want more water? Do you want me to take these plates? And I want to say, do you want me to get out of here? <laughs> and uh, they probably want to say, well, yeah, the lunch rush was over. So, and, and by the way, if anybody knocks at the door at the back, Gary, the trick-or-treat candy's on the desk in the office. So grab it and you can hand out the trick-or-treat candy if someone comes trick-or-treating. It is Halloween. <laughs> nice costume. <clears throat> we'll leave it that. Second Chronicles, chapter 34. I want to pick up on something I, I danced around last week. We looked at, at, at Joash, good king, his, his revival incentives, what is revival. And, and, and when you look at Joash, Hezekiah, you got to look at probably one of the greatest and that was Josiah, boy king, eight years old, under the guidance of Hilkiah, and brought massive reforms to Judah, fulfilling what the prophet had told, uh, well, I just went blank with the king, the second king of, of Judah, telling him, or, or telling, actually it was Jeroboam telling him, about the one who was going to come and, and tear down all the idols and burn and crush the bones of the wicked kings and the prophets and the altar was smashed and broken in half and Josiah is the fulfillment of that. And Josiah, one of the things about him is he's actually compared to King David. Of all the, the kings, David, the man after God's own heart. David, the, the, the kingdom was, was promised a royal heir. His, king, his uh, royal heir would always be on the throne. The Savior, the Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, come from the lineage of David and, and Josiah compared to David doing what was right in the sight of the Lord, but Jeremiah uh, using those, those words comparing him to David. But there's one thing about Josiah that I love, and, and well, let's just get into the, into the scripture. I, I would love to read the whole chapter, Bob, but I too have had one, one wise person tell me that you don't need to read the whole chapter if you're not, you know. So we're just going to read a, a portion of it. Well, I want to start just, just at the first. Let's get the background of Josiah. Now, remember, Josiah was the grandson of the most evil king. Second Chronicles 34. Josiah was the grandson of the most evil king in the history. Of Judah. But the amazing thing is, as a lot of people miss, when Josiah was taken by the king of Assyria captive and then on to Babylon for a short spell and let free, now Manasseh reigned 55 years, longest reigning king. He tried to undo what he had done. But Josiah did not have the opportunity probably to know his grandfather or know of him would be about it. And you look at Manasseh, he was the son of Hezekiah, who was a great king, brought great reform, but Hezekiah's pride got the best of him. But Josiah, boy king, verse 1, chapter 34, 2 Chronicles, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And, and listen to this. Walked in the ways of his father, David. Wow. What a testimony. Especially coming 
from an evil father who only reigned two years, a grandfather who is known as the most wicked, causing his sons to walk through fire, go through the fire. Do you know what that means? He sacrificed his sons to the pagan gods, Molech, Kamosh, literally giving his sons up. You know, I've been pretty mad at my son before, but I can never, never sacrifice him to a god, a pagan god. Let me make that straight. But he walked. Here we see where even that background, Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. If I had a tombstone big enough, I wished I could have that put on there. But I can't. Because I have ventured to the right or to the left. No, not as bad as Messiah or Ammon. But I didn't live the life that I should. But what a testimony, what an epitaph, what a way to wrap up your life. Walked in the way of his father David. No, David wasn't his father, but that was the language of the day that they would use. Didn't turn to the right or to the left. What a guy. How? What caused that? Well, let's read further and see. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek um, the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, molded images. What he's showing here is he's breaking down the wooden poles of Asherah. He's tearing down uh, Molech, Kamosh. He's, he's tearing these altars down. He's literally doing what the other kings, they were good kings, but they would not remove the high places. And, and the high places actually started with good intent. When there was no temple to worship at, and the altar was still uh, up at Shiloh, up in, in the Samaria area, while it was still up there, that's where the sacrifices for the feast would take place, their holy days, and many of the people would not travel to there because the temple had not been built. They built their high place, which is a place where they would honor God, higher meaning closer to God, where they would offer their sacrifices. The problem is, where do you think they learned that from? From the people they did not removed from the land when God told them to in the time of Joshua, in the time of the judges. They did not fulfill what God asked them to. So the high places were there. And then after the temple was built, we don't need these high places anymore. Well, theoretically, that's what you would think. And I'm going to make a, a comparison today. Well, I can watch TV at church. I say that as there's a camera over there, and I realize that. I can, I can worship God out in the woods, and you can. You can communicate with God in the woods with a deer or rifle or, or hunting bear or fishing or, or playing golf. Yeah, you can worship, but it's not the same. In these high places, the people would, would literally play prostitute is what the, the prophet said, with the other gods. And, and one of the biggest sins that Judah, that Israel had, is a syncretic religion to where I will worship God and I will worship Baal. I will worship Ashtore. I will worship these other gods that are... I can worship both, and we want to say the same today. I can worship out in the woods. And you know what? You can, but you cannot have the fellowship. You need the fellowship. If you weren't here earlier, there's a group of ladies over here having the best time last Sunday night. And, hey, there was nothing wrong with it. There was no gossip and there wasn't anything else. It was just good, wholesome fellowship. Last Sunday night after church, we closed down the fall festival and some of you were in the chairs out there on the north side of the lot just talking away and having a good time. You can't do that in the woods. You can't do that in the fishing boat. You can't do that on the golf green. You can't do that anywhere but God's house with God's people with God's presence. I know God is present everywhere and I'm really getting off track here. 
But Josiah removed the high places, and it literally made the people have to come to worship. Now, the interesting thing is Hezekiah did the same thing. And when uh, uh, Sennacherib came against Hezekiah and put a siege on the city, and he sent his general to talk to the men on the wall, the general even said, don't be deceived, this God that Hezekiah worships is not going to deliver you. He even told you to take down all your high places. And besides that, has any other God of the other nations that we've conquered, have they delivered them from our hand? Neither will your God. But I want to emphasize, Hezekiah removed the high places and Manasseh put them back. Ammon allowed them to be there. And Josiah, in those four years, in seeking God, the God of his father David, in seeking them, he was so impressed that he knew the high places had to go. And he started tearing them down. He started burning them. Verse uh, 4, They broke down the altars of the Baals in the presence, in his presence, and the incense altars which were above them, he cut down the wooden images, the carved images, the molded images he broke in pieces and made dust of them and scattered them on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priest on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, as far as Naphtali, all around with axes. When he broke down the altars and the wooden images and had beaten the carved images into powder, cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Judah. Now let me tell you what he just did. The southern kingdom is gone. It's fallen. It's under the, the leadership of Assyria. And Josiah, a boy king, is entering into enemy territory and he's destroying what the enemy has allowed. And yet it does not stop him. There's something to be said for a childlike faith. Childlike, how old is Grayson? Nine. Nine? Who do we have here that's 12 years old? Is Shooter 12? Eleven. Eleven. Oh, can you imagine Shooter being king? <laughs> well, I mean, we just said, Grayson, you're, you're nine. Josiah became king at eight years old. Now, I want you guys to think about that a minute, okay? Yeah, scary, isn't it? Well, I don't know. They can't do any. No, I'm not going to go to where we're at. Never mind. Anyway, Josiah, going into enemy territory, he, he has one intent. He's seeking God like his father David. Now, here comes, I think this is the best part. In the 18th year of his reign, he's been king for 10 years, 18 years uh, of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, remember the temple was boarded up. Manasseh put the false gods in the, in the courtyard and Ammon, he just boarded them up, period. And so going in, they cleansed the temple. He sent Shaphan, the son of, of Azaliah, Maaseah, the governor of the city, Joah, the son of Jehoahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord, his God. He came to Hilkiah the priest. They delivered the money that was brought into the house, which the Levites, who kept the doors, had gathered from the land of Manasseh and Ephraim, <laughs> gathering tribute, gathering money from a land that he didn't rule. Now, that could have made king of Assyria, really unhappy. He didn't care. The Levites went and gathered this money. What is it they're gathering? The shekel tax, half shekel tax. Anyone from 20, 20 years up has to pay the half shekel every year. So they're out gathering it so they can repair the temple. They brought the money. Hilkiah now has, uh, has the money. Uh, let's see. From all the remnant of Israel, all Judah, Benjamin, which they had brought back to Jerusalem, then they put it in the hand of the foreman who had the oversight of the house of the Lord and gave it to the workmen and, worked, and they worked in the house of the Lord, repaired re, uh, and restored the house. 
They gave it to the craftsmen and builders to buy new stones, timber for beams, and the floor for the house, or to floor the house, uh, to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. All the men did the work faithfully. Their overseer, uh, overseers were Jathan, Obadiah, uh, the Levites of the sons of Mary, and Zer uh, Zechariah, and Meshulam of the sons of the Kohathites to supervise others of the Levites, all whom were skillful with the instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and the overseers of all who did the work in any kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes, officers, and gatekeepers. I, I love that part. They are, 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 are rebuilding the house of God. Not only are they rebuilding the house of God, they're rebuilding the faith of the people in the land. Here, these next few verses are central to what I want to look at. Now, when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, All that was commanded to your servants they are doing. And they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it to the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then, if you like to underline in your Bible, this is a big then. Then, Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now, I want to stop right there. And, and I want to look at this a minute. I want you to see everything that Josiah did. He did word of mouth from the priest, from the scribes, what was told him, what he learned. Not from his grandfather, not from his father, but from Hilkiah, Shaphan, all of these others. The oral tradition. If you go back to Moses, he tells him when you have a king, that king must write the law. Not just read it, write it. And must read it. Why? So they would know it. I don't know if Josiah was literate. Because it said that Hilkiah, or the Shaphan read this law to him. Most of the kings that we have today were literate. It was, it was a responsibility for them to know how to read and to write. And one of the reasons was is so they could read and write the law of God and know the law of God to lead the people of God according to guess what? The law of God. And we see somewhere after Hezekiah the law disappeared. It's gone. Now, it would be, this, this is an equivalent, Dr. Wearsby says, th this is an equivalent of losing your Bible in the church. No, not for a day, a month, a week, a year, but for over 55, 57 years, plus the 18 years of Josiah's life. So according to my book, that's like 85 years, the word of God has disappeared. And I want you to understand, this isn't just, the law was not just a book like this one. The law would have been the scrolls, probably the Mosaic scrolls. And he probably started reading from Deuteronomy. And if you've never read Deuteronomy 27... 28, 29, 30, 31. Read the blessings and the cursings of God for those who follow and those who disobey. Cursed you will be, blessed you will be. Cursed will be your enemies, blessed you will be. Cursed you will be by your enemies. Josiah has done what he has done without the law of God. And now they come in, and what is it Shaphan's first words were to the king? All the money that we've been 
and gather and then we got in the, all of hey it's all there they're making the repairs oh by the way we found the word we found the law while we were in there I mean when you when you read it it, it literally is just an, an afterthought oh and by the way this big thing that I'm carrying here it's a scroll and we found the book of the law now also, who is it that's carrying it? Shaphan. He's a scribe. A scribe reads, writes, and interprets. In the New Testament, the scribes were the lawyers. They knew the law. Hilkiah the priest didn't go see the king. Shaphan went to the king. And he said, we found the book of the law. And he began to read it before the king. Now look in verse 19. Thus it happened, when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. The king commanded Hilkiah, uh, Ahakim, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe, Asaiah, the servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that's found here, for great is the wrath of the Lord, that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord according to all that is written. Wow. I don't know what it was that he read. I, I really don't. I, I suspect Deuteronomy. Just because Deuteronomy is, is, is really a, a, a parsing down of everything in the first four books of the law, specifically Exodus, Leviticus, in numbers, Exodus and Leviticus particularly, that law is fine-tuned and put down. It's the giving of the law to the second generation through the preaching of Moses at, at different intervals to those people. Whatever it was, his reaction, when the king heard the words, he tore his clothes. Tearing of the clothes was a sign of remorse was a sign of great sorrow. One that, that, that literally would bring fear upon him. And when he heard those words, he, he saw what happened to the tribes of the north in their departure and being led to Assyria. He knew what was coming upon them now, and he knew it was nothing else than the wrath of God. And he said, go inquire and find out. They went to the prophetess Holda, and she told them, go back to the man that inquires and tell him. Now, I'm just going to synopsize here. But go back and tell him that destruction is coming. But because he has humbled himself, it will not be in his day. And we know four kings come after Josiah. Three of them are his sons. They come after Josiah. And they're a failure. They're a failure. One goes to bondage in Egypt. One ends up in Babylon. The other two both reign for about 11 years. Each. And it leads to the destruction. None of them seek after God like Josiah did. When we look at Josiah's reaction, how remarkable it is that the book of the law is found, but what's even more remarkable is it was lost in the temple of God. It's not just leaving your Bible in the church, it's losing your now, I know there's lots of places to lose things. But the scrolls weren't just put anywhere. They were kept in a certain location. And something had happened to where they'd been moved, they'd been hidden, or all of the debris had covered them and could not be found. It bothers me today. Yes, I have a Bible app on my phone. Yes, I use it but I still love my Bible. I got two shelves in my office on the bookshelves 
that are nothing but Bibles. And I'm well on my way to halfway through a third shelf. I love God's Word. I love reading God's Word. I look forward to reading God's Word every day. And what I see today frightens me. As people come to church and walk in carrying I've got it on my phone. And I'm not saying you don't, but God knows whether you're looking at Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. Now, I know I'm talking over the heads of some of us out here that don't have, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. I know the lingo. I can do Facebook. Don't get me further than that. But I don't know what you're doing. Hey, I've heard of the people that go to the bathroom and take their picture on Instagram and post it on Instagram. I don't get those pictures because they don't want me to know and I'm not their friends. Go figure. But we see a, a, a loss of the Word of God. What happens when the battery on your phone gets dead, goes dead? What happens when you drop your phone or run over it with a feed truck or drop it from a shelf in the storage building eight feet down on a concrete floor. Uh, yes, I've done all of those. What happens when, when that happens? See, we need the Word of God and, and, and I deliberately do not put Scripture up on the walls because I want you looking at Scripture. You need to know where it's at, where to find it. Isn't it great? Robbie, Pat, and, and, and Jill, Charlotte, Nikki, they're teaching our kids the books of the Bible and where to find them. It's not going to your phone in the app and going, it's here somewhere, till you find it. And we can lose the Word of God in our churches today. And, you know, we can lose it in our churches today with our churches being full need to take great warning to that. However, I'm preaching to the choir. Because those that are here are probably the ones that need to hear the message the least. To Josiah's credit, he desired to hear what the scrolls said. More than likely from Deuteronomy. And when jo Josiah... When it was read, he was smitten. He was overcome, overtaken by fear, by grief, by remorse, by all of the, the, the things that you can think about in, in sorrow. But how the people respond to God's word is an indication of their appetite and the strength of their desire to please the Lord. Do we read our Bible because, well, that's just what Christians do? Do we read our Bible, well, I'm afraid if I don't, I might get struck dead. Well, I gotta read, my, I gotta read God's Word because God told me to read His Word and I gotta be obedient to, you, to, to God. Why do you read God's Word? How, how bad? There's two questions we need to ask ourselves about God's Word. And we can see Josiah's actions can prompt us to this. What, what do I mean prompt us to this? How bad do we want to hear God's Word? Because you're going to go on and you're going to see some of Josiah's descendants in the book of Jeremiah. He writes out the scroll and they take it to the king and the king, as they read the page, he tears it up and he puts it in the fire. He tears it up and he puts it in the fire, every page that's written. And then he puts out a hit, literally, on Jeremiah. On Jeremiah. The king. So how bad do we want to hear God's word? But the second question that, that, that goes with that is what is our response when we hear God's word? Not listening, nah, 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 
Does it just fly over our head? Are we so preoccupied while we read God's Word? i got to read it 30 minutes. i got 15 to go. I'm good. Let's see. I've still got... And I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And our mind wanders. We're not engaged in what we're doing. You know, it's like a kid. We've done this. You take your kid and you put their hands, your, your hands in, on their face and say, look at me while I'm talking to you. <laughs> For some reason we think that's going to, and, and it does because it's not that, that they can read our lips, but they can because it's focusing their attention not on what's around. What would happen if we're in God's house, the word of God is being read, and you're totally disengaged and the spirit gets a hold of you and God says, listen to what I'm telling you. What would your reaction be? You ever had God's, had God's word in your hand? You're reading it at home, your quiet time, and had the voice of God audibly speak to you? I have. Scared the bewees out of me. I'm telling you, got my attention real quick. And I know now why he did in preparation for something that was going to happen in my life that had he not spoken to me, I would have been totally unprepared for. And I praise God for that. But had I not had my eyes on the word of God and him speaking to me to get my mind engaged into his word, I would have missed it. I would have missed it. What is your response to God's word? How badly do you want to hear it? God's word. Read it for yourselves. Hear it by others. How bad do you want to? How bad do you want to? It's life. <coughs> Moses said it's life. Jesus said he's the bread of life. Corden said man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. Where do we get that from? His word. The written word. And we see Josiah's reaction. I think we can see. It just says he tore his, uh, his clothes. I think he fell on the floor, on his knees, possibly flat, then on his knees, tore his kingly robes, and, and, and was sorrowful for what had happened. This is what's coming. Church, people, believers, we need to wake up. Jesus is real. He is coming back. That trumpet is going to sound. The sky will split. And he's coming back to take us, his church. And I praise God, hallelujah for that. But it breaks my heart the number of people that are not ready, that have heard and have rejected what God's word says. It is appointed for every man to die once and then the judgment. Or the rapture. No man knows the time or hour. Not even Jesus himself. His word. I don't know. Only my father knows. And Paul tells us that day will come. And the sky will split. The trumpet will sound. The graveyard will give up the dead. Then we who remain will be caught up with him in the air. And we will dwell with the Lord for how long? Forever. We need to wake up, and it's all right here in God's Word. We need to have the reaction that Josiah had. We need to be ready, and we need to be telling people to be ready because the day is fastly coming upon us. And we find many that are sleeping at the wheel. And I know when the rapture comes, I'm going to be driving my pickup, and it's going to wreck, and the ones that don't go are going to say, told you that preacher couldn't drive. <laughs> and you know what I'd say? Find the body. It ain't there. What a way to go. What will be your reaction? What's your response? I'll tell you both, both of these things. How bad do you want it? What's your reaction going to be? It's going to be one of three things, which is really one of two things. You're going to accept it. You're going to be ready. You're going to say, I do need to read my Bible more. I do need to know what God's Word said. I need to know, am I ready? I need to know what's in my life that's not ready and need to change it. And what I am doing right, I need to keep doing it. I need to find out what is heaven going to be like. 
What is being in the presence of Jesus going to be like? You know, we want to say we're going to be on this cloud, we're going to strum a harp, and we're going to have wings and a, and a halo over us. I don't see that in the Bible. I really don't. I see a lot of other things in the Bible. I see the new Jerusalem. I see the trees on that river alive. I see that water that's never going to make me want to drink or thirst again. I see a sky that is illuminated, but there's no sun, there's no moon, there's no stars. Why? They don't need one because Jesus is there. It's all in his word. And it's going to be perfect. Can't wait. You will accept it and be ready, or you will reject it. That's not for me. We have people today, honestly, that's not that that Jesus, that God, that heaven stuff, that's not for me. I don't believe in any of that. It's 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 they believe in annihilism. When I die, that's it, the body's gone, and there is nothing left. No spirit, no nothing gone. They haven't read God's word, evidently. Because that's not, well, I don't believe in God's word. Well, that's great, because you don't have to believe in God. And you're going to go to a place where you'll never ever hear or see or have the influence of God again in your life. But make no mistake, there'll be a constant reminder of your choice. Weeping, gnashing your teeth, a fire that never goes out, darkness where you will gnaw your tongue. All of those things. And I believe more. And maybe if Jesus' parable, if, if the correct interpretation of the rich man and Lazarus, maybe that interpretation is where those in hell will look and be able to see what they missed. That would be hell in itself. You can neglect it. And, and that's your choice. God will not force you. He will not force you. Will he send you to hell? No, you make that choice on your own. But then the third one is you can neglect it, which is the same as rejecting it. All, I, I believe in all of that, but you guys have been saying since Jesus went to heaven, when you read Paul, he's saying, I'm coming back quick, I'm coming back quick. When you read Revelation, behold, I'm coming quickly. Get ready, get ready. Well, Revelation, if it was written back in, oh, I don't know, 94, 95 A.D., there's a lot of time. There's like a thousand and nine hundred and thirty years that have passed or something like that. So it's still, well, here we are, same story, same song and dance. So, you know, it's not coming. I think I've still got time when I'm getting ready to die. I'll get right with the man upstairs. Bless your heart. Number one, I'm very insulted you refer to God as the man upstairs. Number two, you don't know. You don't know when that time will come. And you're just playing a game of roulette. And you could possibly lose. You could win, but you still have to answer for all of that. When you hear God's word, what's your reaction? Do you long for God's word? We should. David said it best. Two verses. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Tim's interpretation of that, as long as I've got it before me, I'm not going to stumble. Same chapter. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. We need to hide God's word in our heart. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't get into the book of God, read the book of God, read the word of God, you're not going to have it in your heart. You can't do it through osmosis. Sleep on it at night and hope it absorbs. It doesn't work that way. You have to read it. You have to study it. You have to love it. You know, that's when you become literally a student of the Bible. I think I finally got out of kindergarten. But I feel like I'm in grade school in a lot of ways. When we get to heaven, then we can graduate. We're not there yet. So don't put your book down. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And I thank you for the life of Josiah. I know he wasn't a perfect man. I know he wasn't David. But he was a man like David. Seeking after you. And I thank you.
that he was a broken man when he heard the law that was read. When he tore his clothes. When he sent out others to find out what would happen for grave was the sin of his forefathers and the people. May we be not like Josiah and seek your word. For I feel like we're living in a time, God, where the people were like the ones before Josiah. Be with us as we leave here this week. Forgive us where we failed you. We love you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. See you Wednesday.